they're all important. But the first two blocks that I chose were the cornerstones. And if any structure is to have any strength or solidity, you better have a strong foundation. And of course, the, uh, the cornerstones anchor the foundation. And one cornerstone is industriousness, and the other one is enthusiasm. I think you have to work hard at whatever you're doing. If you're looking for the shortcut, the trick, the easy way, you can get by, perhaps, for a while, but you won't be strengthening the talents that lie within you. I, I, I often use uh, verse forms to, to make a point. And Grant Rice wrote a poem called How to Be a Champion. In, in part, he said, you wonder how they do it. You look to see the knack. You watch the foot in action, or the shoulder, or the back. But when you spot the answer where the higher glamours lurk, you find it moving higher up the laurel-covered spire that the most of it is practice and the rest of it is work. And there's another verse or two that say essentially the same thing, and there's a lot of truth in that. And then and, and the other enthusiasm. If you don't like what you're doing, how can the world can you do the best of which you're capable? You, you can't reach your own particular level of competency unless you enjoy it, unless you're enthusiastic about it. You may be talented, but, and you may be better than somebody else, but if it's not near your own particular level of competency, you're not really succeeding. You're, of, course, of course, we're all imperfect, and, and there's no such thing as perfection, but it's something to work toward. And, and uh, uh, I don't know. I, I, the, I, those blocks just stand out. I never changed them. And through the 14 years, next 14 years, when I worked on the various blocks, I had a lot of ideas. I discarded some. I put something in their place. I moved the position within the structure of some. But I never changed the cornerstones. They still remained constant, and I still believe that they are the cornerstones for success. In the foundation, I had three blocks. They include others, and that adds strength. And then we work up to the very top of being competitive greatness. That's the, that's the last block. Well, how do you become that? By being industrious and enthusiastic and being conditioned and having the skills and being imbued with consideration for others and so on. So they lead up. And these things lead up below the top block. I have poise and confidence. Well, how do you gain poise? By being prepared. And how do you get prepared? By being industrious, by being enthusiastic. And so these others. So it, it leads up to, the, in, to my way of thinking. Now, perhaps it wouldn't be to somebody else, but it, 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 it does uh, to mine. You know, um, to, in trying to use that in helping me become a better teacher, then I can help those under my supervision be better. In the mid-30s, about the time I was started and had coined my definition, I was working on this, I, I ran across a couple of things that, that would st have stayed with me always. One was a verse that said, uh, um, no written word, no spoken plea can teach our youth what they should be, nor all the books on all the shelves. It's what the teachers are themselves. We need that. It's like we need models that are good, positive models. And I, I, I ran across that. And then another thing I ran across that I've never forgotten was a, 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 some lady was asked, a lady teacher, been teaching for many years and asked why she taught. And uh, she later wrote some things down, and she said, they ask me why I teach, and I reply, where could I find such splendid company? There sits a statesman, strong, unbiased, wise, another later Webster, silver-tongued. A doctor sits beside him, upward rise. No, see, a doctor sits beside him, whose quick, steady hand may mend a bone or stem the lifeblood's flow. And they're a builder. Upward rise the arches of that church he builds wherein that minister may speak the word of God and love lead a stumbling soul to touch the Christ. And all about a gathering of teachers, nurses, laborers, those who work and vote and build and plan and pray into a great tomorrow. And I say, I may, I, I may not uh, see uh, the, 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 the church or, or hear the word or eat the food. Their hands may grow, and yet again I may. And later I may say, I knew him once, and he was weak, or strong, or bold, or proud, or gay. I knew him once, but then he was a boy. They ask me why I teach, and I reply, where could I find such splendid company? And as a teacher, you see that. 
you see these youngsters. Now I saw that all those in my English classes grew up. I saw a youngster become an admiral in the Navy. I saw them become doctors and dentists and just all different professions. And whether you do it, did really or not, you like to feel maybe I helped them a little, maybe I did in a little way. And if some of them failed for some reason, what could I have done? You, you think about that. Well, the handwriting on the wall became in 63. In 62, we went to the final four, and, and it surprised me that we could get to the final four under the conditions in which we were working, because they were still the same. And I, w I was surprised. I didn't think we could ever advance that far, and we did. And uh, so um, um, that sort of changed my attitude a little bit, in a way. And in 63, I decided to stick with something that had been very successful for me in, in, at Indiana State in high school, and that was a, a pressing defense. I had tried it through the 50s at UCLA, and, but I gave up on it. I, I gave up on it too soon, and, and I shouldn't have. But I, 63, I looked at the personnel that I had, and I, I'm going to stick with it this year, and I'll find out. And uh, we, we improved regularly, and I had all those starters back for 64. And uh, I, uh, Pete Blackman, who had played for me in 62, was now in the Navy in Hawaii, and we used to write things back and forth in poetic form. And uh, I wrote him one thing in about in 63, and I, and I close it with a verse that ends, we could be champs in 64. Well, <laughs> we'd have it in 64, we went undefeated. But I had the same personnel. It was, uh, I had the greatest person to play the number five position in the zone press that, that, that I've seen play, and that's Keith Erickson, a great competitor, and had all the physical qualifications, and was, um, as, as some say, had the guts of a burglar in a sense, and uh, was just what you need for that. And I had other, I had a great number one person, a left-hander, an idea, it's ideal to have a left-hander in that number one position. And I had to, I had the personnel to make this go, and we did go undefeated in, in uh, 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 64. Now, it's unusual that we would go undefeated, but uh, I knew uh, the way the team had come along in 63, and a lot of people don't know this, but we, could, we came close to the end of 63. We got beaten in the regional tournament by a team that it was just red hot, and they just hit everything, which happened once in a while, and it could have happened in some of the years we won it all. Fortunately, it didn't, but uh, it could have. And um, uh, so, uh, but I stuck with it in 63, and then 64, it, it just, everything came together. Then I lost three starters in 64, but I had the two key ones in for the defense. I had the two key ones back. I lost Hazard, a great ball hander, offensive, but I had the key pressing players, but the number one, Goodrich, and the number five, Erickson. I had them back in, in uh, 65. And uh, in 65, we went back to Illinois and played the first game of the season, and they threshed us good. And we just come off of 30 straight, and they threshed us good, which was probably a awakening uh, to some of uh, the players. And... Uh, we lost only one other game the rest of that season and repeated it the, as, the, as the champions. And the other uh, game we lost was also to a uh, Big Ten team, Iowa. And, but I had Erickson hurt in that game, and we, we were not the same uh, uh, team without Erickson at all. But uh, I, I was very, very proud of that 65 team, just as proud as the 64. But I was, I was very proud of my 48-49 team. They weren't supposed to do anything. Supposed to finish last. We won the conference, won 22 games. No, no, ch no. A national championship team gave me any more pleasure than that. The very first team I had at UCLA. Height-wise, they're probably the uh, the shortest teams to ever win, and I suspect now probably the shortest teams that ever will win, as far as height-wise is concerned. But <laughs> size isn't always the answer at all, and. Uh, uh, you know, they say uh, 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 more isn't always best. And uh, uh, certainly I think uh, it was proven uh, by those two teams. But they, they came together real well. And, and he, he, players accepted their roles. I believe coaches today are having a little more trouble getting players to accept roles today. 
and and that makes it a little more difficult. But those did, they 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 definitely did, and and uh, as as a unit they were strong. Maybe there were some other teams that might have been individually a better, but as a unit these were two very uh, very strong teams. No, and I don't think anyone would could have imagined that. Uh, but I never thought under the condition, well, after 62, I thought maybe we have a chance. But I think the most amazing of all our championships was the first two under the conditions with, the, with no home court, in a sense, and, uh, and the practice conditions. And generally speaking, we had only two baskets and, and a lot of conflicts and no private dressing rooms, no private shower rooms, uh, ever, just one big thing for all sports. And... Uh, if you can do it with that, when you got Polly Pavilion, my goodness, you know, it ought to be easy now. <laughs> of course, players like Alcindor made it a little easier too. <laughs> when Wilt Chamberlain came to the Lakers, I was invited to the press conference announcing this. And uh, in the press conference, uh, one uh, member of the press asked Wilt, said, do you think that Bill Van Bredikoff can handle you? Bill Van Bredikoff was the coach of the Lakers at the time. And Wilt said, no one handles me. I am a person, not a thing. You handle things, you work with people. I think I can work with anyone. Just prior to this, my coaching book, Practical Modern Basketball, had been published, and I had a section in this book entitled, Handling Your Players. I left this meeting, came home, and took my book and marked out, crossed out, handling your players, but working with your players. And any place that I had alluded to handling your players, I changed. I called the publisher and wanted that correction made for any future editions. So you have to work with them. I think any person in any, in any business, any person of leadership, those under your supervision, must be made to feel they're working with you, not for you. Otherwise, they'll just punch the clock in and out, and that's it. Uh, so um, uh, I think with players, uh, you have to have certain standards. You have to back them up. If you have a rule, back it up. Don't put a rule in that you're not going to back up. And when you have it in there, back it up. But, but don't, don't... If someone uh, fails in some way, don't keep after them the next day. Dismiss them, maybe practice that day, but the next day don't say, you don't do that again. Take care of when it happens, just as when your youngsters misbehave. Take care of it then, and don't have to keep bringing it up. Now, if it, if it occurs over and over, you, the method you used didn't correct it, then you had to change your method. So um, I think that, well, for example, i give you a good example. The year after... Alcindor graduated. We had a, uh, uh, they have press day on October the 14th. Practice can't start till the 15th, but you can have press and picture day the day before. I always tried to get all pictures and, and uh, meetings with, the, with the interviews of the press and so on with the players that day. I never wanted press coming in trying to get a kid out of practice or out of class or something to to have an interview with him. I tried to get all that possible at that particular time. And I had two players from the year, preceding year that are going to be very, very fine players this year. They came to practice or to that picture day and they had been growing mutton chops from the end of the preceding year until now. And this is a few months now. And uh, I knew they were doing this. And I also know their kids, and I knew that they're going to test me. I know that's coming. And um, so when they came to draw their uniforms, I would put them in, in that day before practicing start. I had to put out the game uniforms to get uh, pictures and everything. And they came to draw their uniforms, and they hadn't taken care of themselves. And uh, I'm there with my managers because I want to anticipate, try anything of the problems. I know no uniforms. And one of them said, why not? I said, you know why. I'm not going to explain it again to you. You have about 15 minutes to determine whether you're going to play this year or not. You have 15 minutes to get up and see Ducky Drake in our training room, our trainer, and let him get busy with his razor and, and, and clippers and get you in shape. 
He said, you don't have that big guy this year. And I said, no, 14 minutes, I'm not going to have either one of you two if you don't get up there. Now make up your minds now. Well, they stared at me. Then they turned and ran up. They got fixed up. They got their buttons on. They were testing me. I know they're testing me. And um, after the day is over, they hung around. They kept hanging around till everybody's gone. I, I'm, I'm usually the last out along with the last to leave. The manager's seat, everything's put away and everything. And, and uh, one of them said, you know, can we talk to you, coach? And I said, sure. And uh, he said, we're sorry. I said, that's okay. I said, when I was your age, I tested people too. But now, let's have a great year. You bet we will. He said, we'll, we'll show we can win. We're not that big guy. And they ran away, happy. No, they're not mad. I, they'd have lost all respect. They'd have been disappointed, I'm sure, if I had given in to them, rather than disappointed, because they didn't. And what would they have that done with the rest of my team, too, if I give in to them? They knew. We'd had a meeting. I always have a meeting with my players about the 1st of October, two weeks before practice starts, when I go over all these things and about their conduct and their courtesy to people and managers. And the managers are not their servants. They're there to help, and I don't want them picking up your towels and, and um, tape and gum wrappers, and orange peels and things. You pick them up yourself and put them in there. And uh, now, some of you will forget on time. I know that, and I'll pick up when I see it. Somebody's forgotten. But if somebody forgets daily, you're going to be in trouble. And um, so I go over all these things and about their hair and, uh, and mustaches, which I didn't permit, and long sideburns and so on. So uh, they knew about this. And it isn't something that I sprung on them by surprise. They all know this in advance. And a kid knew about my feelings about those things when I recruited them. And, and uh, um, like I'm asked today, oh, well, how about these youngsters that are coming in now with earrings and, uh, and maybe tattoos? And I said, well, I wouldn't have had them because they'd know before they came that I won't have it. And, and you know, oh, we can't do that. No, yes, you can. If you stick up to it, if you know, uh, if you, do it, you stick up to it. There's always somebody else. No, no one's indispensable, even you. In looking back, you would say it was difficult, but you didn't think it was difficult at the time. I grew up on a farm. We lost the farm in the Depression the year I was a freshman in high school, and then we moved into this little town, Martinsville. But while on the farm, where we had no running water and uh, no electricity, and practically everything we ate, we grew. Uh, and and I, when I think back of my poor mother, of hand washing everything, and 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 with uh, three, uh, four sons, and and her husband, uh, farmers in a sense, and getting dirty and having to do all the laundry and. It was, must have been extremely difficult for my mother and then cooking for all of those. But we didn't think it was tough at the time. When you look back on it, it looked like it was very difficult. But it wasn't the time. We loved it. I think, for example, um, we read more. There wasn't television. There wasn't radio to speak of, a little radio. Uh, we didn't have it, but there was. And, uh, but uh, Dad would read to us in the evenings. Uh, we, I know uh, he read the Bible every day and insisted that we did. And, but he read poetry to us. I can still remember him, him reading Hiawatha, By the Shores of Gitchagumi, By the Shining Big Sea Water, Live the Big Bob of Nokomis, Daughter. I can just remember that and, and some of the other things. And that uh, encouraged my love for poetry, in which I always love, and probably the back of why that all, all um, four sons uh, there were no athletic scholarships in those days, and mother and dad didn't have financial means to help. But all four sons got out of college. They, they worked their way through all of them, and, uh, and either majored or minored all of them in English, every one of them. And everyone became an uh, administrator. That is, uh, not all uh, took positions. I guess they all did, but me. I never became a principal or administrator, but I, had a, I have a lifetime um, principal and superintendent's license in the state of Indiana, as well as a teacher's license of English. So, um, but it was, it was nice. Like Mark Twain, when I was young, I probably didn't appreciate my father at all, but in thinking back of some of the things that, uh, that he did that I think became so meaningful, which he didn't realize at the time, uh, for example, he tried to get across to us, never try to be better than someone else. Learn from others 
and never cease trying to be the best you can be at whatever you're doing. It don't make a difference what it is, just try to be the best you can possibly be. Maybe that won't be better than someone else, but that, that's no problem. It will be better than somebody else probably, but somebody else is going to be better than that. Don't worry about that. If you get yourself uh, too engrossed or concerned in regard to the things over which you have no control, it's going to adversely affect the things over which you have control. Now, I can remember his trying to get that idea across. Now, I remember two sets of threes that he ga gave us. One was never lie, never cheat, never steal. Now, I've heard that since in different ways, but the first time I've heard it was from my dad. And the other one that I'd never heard from anyone else was don't whine, don't complain, and don't alibi. And he tried to get the, those ideas across. Maybe not in so many words, but by action. He, he, he walked it. Let me put it that way. He was a gentle man, but physically strong, I think, but was gentle. As, as Mr. Lincoln said, there's nothing stronger than gentleness. And I think perhaps my dad emanated that. I really believe that. And then when I graduated from the small country grade school in the eighth grade, he gave me this little card. And he, all he said was, son, try to live up to this. And on one side was a verse that said, uh, four things a man must learn to do if he would make his life more true, to think without confusion clearly, to love his fellow man sincerely, to act from honest motives purely, to trust in God and heaven securely. And on the other side was a seven-point creed that I say I've tried to live up to. I haven't, but I'm weak at times. And, but one was be true to yourself, help others, make friendship a fine art, uh, drink deeply from good books, um, make each day your masterpiece, build a shelter against a rainy day by the life you live, and uh, give thanks for your blessings and pray for guidance every day. Well, just graduated from the eighth grade, that little card, somehow, somehow, I kept it with me until it completely worn out, but I have it, I carry it around in a card, the same thing now, and always have it with me. Not the one that the original that Dad gave me because it just simply wore out. But uh, things like that. My, my father was a good person. I don't believe there's ever been a better person than my dad. As, as a person, he was a good person. And, and uh, I owe so much to my dad. We had a little country grade school, outdoor court. No, no indoor, uh, shovel snow out of the, off the court and play and no uniforms. We'd have a little uh, thing we'd put over our, the bib of our overalls and uh, uh, maybe a different type of shoes, but not basketball shoes in the sense that we have now. But uh, uh, we had a grade school team and we played some other grade schools from around the, the area. And then that just carried on because it was basketball area. <laughs> Indiana's crazy over basketball some ways too crazy. But uh, then I went to Martinsville, who had a fine reputation, and, and we had great teams uh, 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 while I was there. As a matter of fact, uh, we went to the championship game of the state tournament all three of my years in high school, got the very last game. and We, we lost it twice and won it once. Uh, but uh, like everybody, <laughs> it was, it was every, everybody was crazy over basketball. Our uh, a gymnasium in this little town at that time had 4,800 people, and yet they had built the gymnasium the year before I entered high school that seated 5,200, and it was always full. And that's amazing for uh, people. People don't believe me when I tell them about that here in California. Californians just don't believe that, but it's true. You know, it really isn't my first love. Baseball was always my first love. That's my favorite sport, but... Uh, Basketball to me is the greatest spectator sport and, and for a number of reasons. It's played with the largest object, the basketball is larger. It's, uh, the spectators are closer to the action. Uh, they can follow the ball. You can't always follow the baseball or the puck or the football, but you can follow the basketball. And it's a fast game. It's a game of action. Uh, it has all the ingredients, to, I, I think, to make it a tremendous uh, spectator sport. And I think it is the best, uh, uh, the best of all the spectator sports. Uh, it's a team game. Uh, uh, I'm concerned about the basketball today somewhat. I think it's becoming too much showmanship. And I don't like that. If I want showmanship, I'll go see the Globetrotters. And, and that's what I go for. And uh, you see it. 
I don't, I don't want to see it. Like in the pros today, the player that I would rather see than anybody else is, is John Stockton from Utah, the, the all-time leader in assists. But it's not just because he's the all-time leader in assists. It, it, it's his demeanor. He never gets mad. He's a spirited player, but never gets mad. He's quick. He's intelligent. He, he's unselfish, and he can do all things well. And... Um, but it, it's, a, it's, it's a sport that the fans do. I, I often say, I've had many fans while I was coaching say to me, now, now, Coach, I don't know anything about basketball, but, and then they'd start telling you what you're doing wrong or why aren't you doing this or why aren't you doing that. And, and the fact that they're interested, that should never upset a coach. He should be pleased that they are interested. Uh, that shows that they are. Just in playing with others, I seemed to do well. When I was in grade school, I seemed to do well. I, I, would, I would be one of the better ones, and in high school, I was one of the better ones, and in college, one of the better ones. Just the Lord gave me some natural things. Uh, uh, perhaps in my coaching experience, I found out from my, my own personal playing experience that I didn't have as much size as many, but I was quicker than, than most all. And that was my strength. So. In my recruiting and all the years when I became a college coach, I'm recruiting for quickness. Now, you, you want a certain amount of size, and, and, but more coaches will give up some quickness to get more size. I would not. I would give up some size to get more quickness. I, I, wanted, I hoped my forwards would be quicker than opposing forwards. I hoped that my guards would be uh, quicker than opposing guards. I hoped my postmen would be uh, quicker than opposing postmen. And, and that's what I'm looking for, and then I'm trying to incorporate that in making it into a team game. God, it is such a team game. It's a beautiful game when it's played as a team. To me, it's not beautiful when it's individual and one working one-on-one -on -one and going in and making a fancy dunk. Uh, and that, that isn't pretty to me. That, that, that may be what most of the fans seem to love, but I don't. I see no reason why not. Uh, if you show the, those under your supervision, you really, really care for them, and that uh, you're interested in the group as a whole, but also as them individually. As my, one of my favorite coaches, Samus Alonzo Stagg, once said, he never had a player he did not love. He had many he didn't like and didn't respect, but he loved them just the same. I hope my players knew that I loved them all. Uh, there are times I didn't like them. There are times I didn't like my own children, but it never had anything to do with my love for them. And uh, I, I think so. I think if people, whether it be basketball players or people under your supervision in another area, if they know you care for them, and they know that if you're not a dictator, and if you know, make them feel that they're working with you, not for you, I don't know why I couldn't today. My wife, my wife, Nellie, Nellie, my high school sweetheart. Uh, she, she helped me in so many ways. Um, I, I guess suppose people today might say, uh, hard to believe, but I was, I was an extremely shy uh, uh, person, maybe being raised in the country, maybe a little bit. I, I, maybe that had something to do with it. But she got me uh, uh, to go to take uh, speech classes. Uh, public speaking, which I probably wouldn't have done because I just could hardly do that. And that, I know that was a great help to me. And then in so many other ways, uh, she was a year behind me in high school, but when we met, uh, I don't know why, I've got a picture in there when she was 15 and I was 16. It seemed like one of those things that was just love at first sight in a sense. She's the only girl I ever went with. and. Uh, uh, I was a year ahead of her, and I went away to college. Since she graduated from high school, and then worked, um, and we didn't get to see each other that much because times were hard. And even though it was only 70, 80 miles from Lafayette to Martinsville, uh, and the bus might have been 10 or 15 cents, and didn't have it, <laughs> and she did either. So we didn't get together much. But but we knew as soon as I got a job and got married, uh, we were gonna. Or, or got a job, <laughs> graduated and got a job, but we'd get married, and, and, and we did. And she was a, a tremendous influence uh, in so many ways. And then I, I'd say that uh, uh, my college coach, Piggy Lambert, who's one of the most principled persons I've ever known, he had a man of extremely high principles, and he had a, a lot of uh, effect, I think, on my life. And then I think the head of the English department at uh, 
Purdue University, uh, Dr. Creek, who uh, who somehow took a liking to me and and uh, and tried to get me to forget sports completely and, and just concentrate on becoming a college English uh, a professor, stay on in, a, in a, some sort of a scholarship that he could give me for a graduate scholarship. And but I wanted to get married and get a job and, and get out. So, but I'd, I'd say that my my father and, and mother too. I don't want to neglect my mother. Uh, and, and my wife and, and, and Piggy Lambert, my college coach at Purdue, probably had more influence on on the, what I became as a teacher, and that's all I was, a teacher, and that's all I was as a basketball coach, that's just a teacher. I remember uh, my math teacher in high school, Dr. Rowdy Bush, I remember very, 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 very well, and, and Catherine Burton, my Latin teacher, I remember very well, that's her high school, and, and uh, uh, Mr. Stalker, my science uh, teacher, I remember them very well, and uh, various English teachers, uh, Miss Phillips and, and Miss French, and uh, many of them, and they all, they all, <laughs> I think, affected you in different ways. Uh, some a little more in one area, and uh, some another. But I, I remember so many of them far more than I do my college professors. <laughs> Uh, poetry, uh, 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 the early English poets, and I, I enjoyed the early American poets, to, uh, poets too, but the Victorian era poets I enjoyed uh, uh, very much, all of them. And uh, then uh, I enjoyed the, the uh, oh, uh, various, uh, uh, well, I, 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 Dickens and, and, and uh, um, oh, I loved all of Shakespeare, always. <laughs> Loved his place. I, I, uh, in, in, in college, uh, on one year I had a whole semester of Macbeth and another whole semester of Hamlet. Now in high school, I taught Hamlet and Macbeth. I had two weeks, and um, you can know see what you can do in that time. But uh, they had a feeling to me. Now and just for pleasure reading, you can see up there I have all of Zane Gray's Western books. I like them. Uh, and and uh, as a matter of fact, Dr. Creek, the head of the department, encouraged people to, to, to read the Zane Gray books at that particular time. It's strange. And then uh, 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 some of the good Western writers I enjoyed, but, but I, I, I like them all. And I like good today. I try to get all of uh, Lou, of uh, Lou Biscaglia's books. And, and, uh, and, well, I like a lot of them. <laughs> I'm not. But one of my favorite books of all time is... Uh, is uh, 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 Lloyd Douglas's The Robe, and uh, you know, one of my very favorite, I can't think of the title of it now, the other book by uh, Lloyd Douglas. But, uh, but I, I enjoyed reading, I like, I, I, and I like pretty much all kinds. I've got a lot of books on basketball in the other room, and I've got a lot of books on uh, biographies. I have uh, biographies of, uh, of many uh, uh, coaches that more or less were in the limelight, but also of many, many people who I know. Like my favorite people that I'd like to study is uh, Mahatma Gandhi, and um, of course my favorite person in the world today is uh, Mother Teresa. I've got a whole group of Lincoln's books, if you notice in the hallway, and all things of Lincoln. He's my favorite American. and. Um, but uh, books of other, a lot of uh, different people, uh, Churchill and, and, and various ones that uh, have uh, had a certain impact, I feel, on, on civilization as a whole. Well, there's too much leaning toward the, the athlete-student, in my opinion, rather than the student-athlete. Uh, I, one of the things I'm most proud of, uh, my years at UCLA, and most people think, well, because of winning championships, that practically all my players graduated, and most of them in four years, and when most students today are taking five, and the fact that most of my players are, have done well in whatever profession they've chosen. Some 30 of my players uh, became attorneys, uh, dentists, lawyers, eight ministers, teachers, uh, just in all professions, but it doesn't make any difference what the profession has been. Uh, very few of the players I've had have been have failed to be successful. Practically all of them have been successful reasonably. And I don't necessarily mean materially wise, but they've been successful in, in whatever profession they chose, and that makes me very proud.
Well, Lawrence Scheidler was my uh, math teacher, and uh, he was very strict. And uh, but he he made us he made us concentrate. And uh, uh, one time he had us define success in class. Uh, seems that seems funny, funny, and maybe if a math teacher doing that, you would think that might be an, an English teacher or or government or some other. But he was a math teacher, and he had us do that. And uh, uh, I never forgot about that. The different definitions that the various ones have. And then after I had graduated from Purdue and entered the teaching profession, I became a little bit disillusioned with what parents seemed to expect from their youngsters, an A or a B. And if they didn't get an A or a B, and in one way or another, uh, maybe subtly, but they, they would make the youngster or the teacher feel that they had failed. They seemed to be very happy if the, youngster, uh, uh, the neighbor's children got C's, of course. They were average, but for their own. And I didn't understand that then. I had... Uh, it was very young and, and didn't quite, as I, as I got older and had children of my own, I understand it a little better, but uh, uh, I didn't like that way of, of judging any more than I like even then the way they judge athletic coaches and teams. They use the winning percentage there and, and that's not an accurate way of judging a success. So I wanted to come up with something of, myself, of my own and, and I think there were three things that entered into it. One was Mr. Scheidler's class when we discussed discuss, uh, discussed success and, and came up with our own definitions. Then my dad about never trying to be better than someone else, learn from others, and never cease trying to do the best you could be. And then about that time I ran across a verse and always being interested in verse that, that makes a point. Just one little simple said, at God's footstool to confess a poor soul knelt and bowed his head. I failed, he cried. The master said, thou didst thy best. That is success. I think those things, more than anything else, uh, uh, accounted for my own definition. And I did this in 1934, and, and the definition I coined for success is peace of mind, attained only through self-satisfaction in knowing you made the effort to become the best of which you're capable. Now, we're all equal there. We're not all equal as, in, as far as intelligence is concerned. We're not equal as far as size. We're not equal as far as appearance. We do not all have the same opportunities. We're not born in the same environments. But we're all absolutely equal in having the opportunity to make the most of what we have and and, and, and not comparing or worrying about what others have. And I, I started, I, I coined that in 1934, and then later started working on my pyramid, and I worked on that for the next 14 years, uh, placing uh, success according to my definition at the apex of this structure, and then working up from the blocks, from the foundation, cornerstones, the foundation, and then, then up. And, uh, but I'd say that those were the things that, uh, that uh, I probably had more to do with a definition than anything else I could think of. I was just teaching basketball rather than English. But you have a, a it's different in, in, in sports. In, in my English, I, I had them under uh, mental, and to some degree, emotional. In basketball or sports, I have a mental, emotional, and physical. So you, some ways, get closer to them. When I was in the service uh, in World War II, one time I hadn't gotten mail for a while, and I got a bunch of it. I had a lot of letters from, uh, from athletes that had played on my uh, basketball or baseball or tennis teams in high school, all optimistic. Some of them never came back, but they were very optimistic. No, no complaining. I didn't have very many letters from my English students, and I'd had a lot more English students in a sense than I had athletes. Didn't have that many. You get closer to them. Uh, and, and it's, um, I love to teach English. I would have always loved to have taught English. But um, you can get closer to those under your supervision in sports, I believe, than you do in just the classroom. Well, in anything, failure to prepare is preparing to fail. And uh, like one of the uh, 
uh, points in the seven point creed that my dad gave me was make each day your masterpiece. Now you're not going to make great improvement in one day. But if you miss out one day, you've lost a little bit. You've got to build up a little each day. Uh, it's little things that eventually become big things and make big things happen. It's, it's the many, the, the, the building up in the little things. And uh, uh, the youngsters must understand that. But where I, I believe a little different uh, than, than many coaches, as a matter of fact. I wanted my players, and tried to get this across to them, when you come on the basketball floor each afternoon, for the next approximately two hours, you are a basketball player. That's all. I'm looking of you and thinking of you as a basketball player. That is all. As soon as practice is over, you are not a basketball player. You are a student at UCLA. And you better keep that in mind. You're a student. That's the reason you're here. Basketball may be, in most of your cases, giving you a scholarship and it's paying your way. But if you don't, uh, if you start putting basketball ahead of your academics, <laughs> you're not going to have either very long. Or uh, you must have, uh, everyone must have a certain amount of social activity. But if you put social activities ahead of your academics or your basketball, you're not going to have any of them at all before very long. At least you won't have here. Uh, so uh, I think that, that that must be stressed because it, it should be the student athlete, not the athlete student. The rapport that you have with so many youngsters, so. Hardly a day goes by that I don't get a call or a letter from someone who was under my supervision in the past, going back to my very first years at UCLA, going back to when I was at Indiana State, some even going back when I taught in high school. And um, that's the relationships that you have, as I mentioned a moment ago, because of the way you're working with them, more than just from the mental aspect. You, you get closer to them. They, they, be, they become almost like your children. Neck, they're, they're closest to you. Next to your own flesh and blood, you get very close to them. Their joys are your joys. Their sorrows are your sorrows. And, and that goes on forever. It doesn't end when they leave your supervision. That, that's with you forever. And, and I can name almost all of the, the basketball players who played for me uh, uh, even even going back in high school, but I can't begin to name all the English students that I had. Well, you, you must set an example. Uh, your your players must know that you care for them more than just as athletes. Uh, certainly, they understand that you they are there because of their athletic ability. I'm speaking of college now. That's why they're there. That's paying their way. But when you have them under your supervision, they must understand that, and, and it's up to you to make sure that they understand that you care for them as individuals. Uh, as I mentioned a, a moment ago, as Amos Alonzo Stagg said, uh, he never had one he didn't love. Love him, he didn't like. Uh, couldn't respect, but he loved them just the same. Um, he also said that uh, that you couldn't tell whether you had a successful season until 20 years or so after they've graduated. And there's a lot to that, too. And if your players come to the belief, which they won't know when they first come to you, it will be your actions that will determine this. That'll, that'll be what determines it. And it won't be from from the things you say. That'll have some influence, yes. But are you walking it or just talking it? Uh, and you can't fool these kids. And if they, you should, it should be your responsibility to, to uh, lead them in a way that's going to be beneficial to them all their lives, not just through their athletic days. And, and I really think most coaches do that. I think most do. Not all, no. But not all doctors are as ethical as they should be. And not all attorneys are as ethical as they should be. And not all businessmen are as ethical as they should be. But I believe the vast majority are. I had a, 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 um, 
Afro-American boy on my team. He wasn't a starter. He was probably the 12th man on a 12-man team. He didn't get to play very much, but he was a member of our team, and he'd, he'd been dressed for every game, was with us in every game, and they did not permit black players to play in the, in the national NAIA tournament at that particular time, so I refused the uh, invitation because of that. Now the next year, since that first year I was at Indiana State, my players, I had, uh, I had uh, 11 freshmen and one sophomore on that team. And uh, so I had them all back the next year, it was just as 11, and, and no one beat anybody else out. I still had the same 12 players uh, the next year. And we were invited again. We had a better year. We'd had a good year the year before, but the next year we have a really better year. And we're invited again, and I refused, but uh, through this youngster's parents and through uh, the NAACP, they felt it would be a good thing. And it might open the doors, in a sense. And um, I was persuaded to do that, to take him. He couldn't stay in the hotel, in the Mule Hotel, with us. He could eat in the Mule Hotel if we ate in a private room. He couldn't eat in the dining room, in a private room. So we had our meals in a private room. He stayed with a minister and his wife, a black minister and his wife, in Kansas City. And was uh, with us in the game, and we had no problems. He was accepted. There was, there was no, no problems at all we had, but he was the only one. It was the first one. But I know in driving from Terre Haute to St. Louis, uh, we stopped some places in Illinois, maybe to eat, they won't let him in. So I would leave, and they take us all, or you don't take any. And then we go someplace else and get some things and take out. But uh, it's good that times have changed. And I, I, I'm proud of the fact that I think in some ways maybe I helped bring about some changes. There's way too much uh, prejudice in this world, not just in race, relig religion, and other ways. There's anything anyone can do to help it, even if it's just a little, that's good because there are a lot of us and everyone would help just a little, that could be a whole lot. It's like we are many, but are we much? We're not much until we all contribute to some degree. Probably more just my dad getting across to us. I think that's one of the things that I can, in one way or another, he tried to teach us that and, and you're as good as anybody but you're no better than anybody. That was, that was the way he tried to get it across. You're as good as anyone, but you're no better than anyone. Don't expect privileges at all in any way. And, and I think maybe from that, uh, we saw no color. As, as, a, as an athlete uh, in uh, college, there were hardly any black athletes that I played against. The same thing in high school. It was gradually coming, gradually coming. My first years of, of teaching in high school, I had no... Uh, black athletes, but later on, a lot of them. So, um, but I think probably it was just my upbringing, more the daughter, uh, dad, and you never, never uh, looked on and on anyone for any any reason at all. Certainly not, not race or religion. It's my own conscience that that, that I think would guide me on thinking things. I make many mistakes, just mistakes of judgment that I have done, but I hope I don't make mistakes of the heart. Uh, but uh, I always felt in, in teaching one of the most difficult things I had to do was say cutting the squad when you have a lot of players come out and they all want to play and you have to you can only take so many you can't take them all that's hard and uh, then sometimes you maybe uh, say you have 15 players you keep to work with and but when you travel you can only take 12 you have to leave three at home that's hard that's hard, particularly at the first when uh, you decide who the 12 or the 15 say were going to be. Those were difficult things. And then at the end of the uh, a, a year, when you give awards, some don't qualify. That's hard. Those are the things that, but, but I tried to do what I think was right. And, and I've always said that when coaches are complaining about pressure, I don't buy that at all. I, I don't buy it at all. Uh, <laughs> you think a salesman doesn't have pressure? You think a barber doesn't have pressure? He didn't cut all the hair in town. The butcher doesn't sell all the meat in town. 
a salesman, if you don't do a good job, <laughs> there'll be somebody else in your spot. So how about a surgeon performing delicate surgery? Oh my goodness, there's far more pressure than in, you know, that a coach is going to have on. And the only pressure that amounts to a hill of beans is the pressure one puts on oneself. And you better put pressure on yourself. If you're not putting pressure on yourself, you're cheating. You're cheating yourself. You're cheating those under whose supervision you are. You're cheating others. So, but if you are affected by outside pressures, that's a weakness. If you let, as a coach, if you let the media affect you, if you let the alumni affect you, if you let the parents affect you, they're going to keep you from doing what you think is proper and right and correct. You should know better than they. You're, you're, this is your profession. You're working at it every day. You see these players every day. You see them together. You should know more about it. And, and if you let the fact that others don't think you do bother you, uh, you can't go and, and cut meat like the butcher can. You can't cut hair like the barber can, and, and so on down the line. So don't worry what others think about it. And I think that somehow I was brought up to, uh, to not let those things bother me. Outside pressures, uh, I never worried about a job. I think I can get a job. Maybe I can't get the job I want. But I'll get a job, and I'll, I'll feed my family. And that's the important thing, uh, to take care of my family. And I think I could do that. So I never worried about a job. And, and I think that probably because I didn't let uh, outside pressures uh, unduly affect me. I, I'm not saying you don't feel them. You don't like to be criticized. No one likes to be criticized. And, and I didn't like to be criticized. But at the same time, you got to accept it and do what you think is right and not let outside criticism sway you. But at the same time, don't be stubborn. You can be wrong, you know. We're all imperfect. Well, I didn't want to quit. I wanted to leave. Let me put it that way. Uh, I had been led to believe, and not promised at all, but I had led, be, led, been led to believe by those under whose supervision I was, and I'd been shown uh, plans for a new building, a place on campus that within, when my three years was up, that I would be, uh, we'd have a nice place to play on campus. Well, at the end of two years, nothing had been done, and I could see that it's not forthcoming. And the conditions in which we uh, had our practices and played our games in comparison to what I'd had, they didn't compare with what we had in high school back in Indiana. And um, um, I, I practicing on the third floor of an old gymnasium with, with gymnasts practicing on one side and Briggs Hunt and his wrestlers down below, and I loved the coaches of both of them. We, we became very close, I think, because we shared adversity, and that brings you closer. And sometimes trampolines on the other side of the floor, and sometimes uh, beautiful young coaches would be up there in leotards jumping on those, and you're trying to get the attention. I, I wouldn't notice them, you see, but my players would. And, uh, and then uh, uh, after my first two or three years, then, as you know, we played games in Venice High School and in Santa Monica City College, as Long Beach City College, Long Beach Auditorium, Pan Pacific, all over. We played home games in as many as nine different places. And uh, uh, I, 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 Purdue came up with a very fine offer, a lot more money and, and, and a lot better conditions in every way. And uh, I was tempted, but I had insisted on a three-year contract when I came. Uh, UCLA only wanted to give me a two-year contract, and I refused to come unless it was a three-year contract. Now, when Purdue contacted Mr. Ackerman and Mr. Johns, uh, the director of athletics and graduate manager of athletics, uh, um, about contacting me, they gave him permission and, and told him it was fine. And they told me that they had given permission, but they reminded me that I had been the one who insisted on a three-year contract and they, they intended to honor, honor their part and they thought I would too. Well, I guess they had learned enough about me in the first two years that, that they probably had me there. And so I decided that I would stay. And following that, I stayed and always on a one-year contract. But the, uh, the one-year contract, always had one stipulation. It had the option for me to renew for one more year. So it was a one-year contract, but it was really a two-year in a sense, and it was a continuing option every year from that time on. 
I never had more than a, what you'd say a one-year contract with an option from the last uh, my last 25 years and or 24 years I guess and uh, but uh, uh, and that was the reason but but by that time after three years we we're more settled more acclimated remember I came from the farm in the country and Los Angeles was frightening to me it was definitely frightening and uh, I'd say for the, at the beginning, uh, Nellie, and my dear wife, wasn't happiest we could be, and, and, and maybe my children at the very beginning. But with three years, uh, my children now they're pretty well settled. They don't want to leave, and you know, they're new friends, and uh, and we we were uh, more acclimated uh, to Los Angeles, and I always loved UCLA. It wasn't it was nothing against UCLA. It was just the fact that the facilities with which we had to work and the conditions on which we played, the practice that way. And uh, you you may or may not have heard this, but for for the, my first 17 years in that old gym, uh, I I with my managers swept and mopped that floor every day before practice. Every day I had the, uh, the buildings of ground people build me two six foot wide brooms and, 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 and six foot wide mops and we'd first sweep it to get the dust off from the activity in there during the day and then dampen these mops and I I took the easy job I must say and, and I didn't want managers doing things that I wouldn't do myself but I'd take the easy job and take a bucket and go along in front of them just like I was feeding the chickens to get them damp and clean them. Now, I did that for 17 years. Now people don't know that and when these coaches today start complaining about things I say ah. Oh. <laughs> with all the things they have today. You know, we got uh, Polly Pavilion. Uh, I just felt, gee, <laughs> this, is, this is tremendous. I mean, really tremendous, and, and it was. But um, uh, yes, uh, I was, um, I would have left had I only uh, taken a two-year contract as they, as they wanted me to when I came. But when I did take a three-year, I've always been against the uh, the uh, people who fail to honor contracts, uh, and it just, uh, I, I, and and I, I'd even go further than that. I see even a, a, a word of mouth that was was good enough to me. That's a contract if you make it. Now today, I don't think even the written contract is. I think that most people, or I shouldn't say most people, many, don't think too much of even that. No, I never believed that. I think that uh, that now, it, it, let's say I were coaching football. I, I, certain defensive people that I'd want really charged up, and I might try to charge them. But I don't think I ever would my uh, touch positions. And basketball is a touch game for the most part, from an offensive point of view, certainly. And uh, I think for every peak there is a valley. And if you try to get them emotionally high, I don't think it's lasting. It's like coming out warming up prior to a game. I want my players to understand we're out there for a purpose. It's to get loosened up, to warmed up, get warmed up, get accustomed to the background behind the baskets and your shooting and, and, and get loosened up to play. And at one time, I think for years I was wrong, I tried to loosen up players all exactly the same. Now, an Al Cinder doesn't need to be loosened up the same way that a Mike Warren does. And yet I was doing that. And for a long time, I, our pregame meal would be exactly the same for everyone in a practically exactly the same amounts. Well, gracious sakes, how wrong I was. And, and uh, I, I learned that finally, uh, this youngster wants the pancakes for him, that's all right. But for another one to have pancakes, oh no, that would be wrong. So one kid could have a, a bowl of chili and a glass of milk. And I'd think that was horrible. And yet I had a player that did that and he never tired. So it depends a little bit on your background, uh, what your custom is. And for a long time, I didn't understand that. And um, I think I think I'd learned this time. Uh, apparently, I was a slow learner. <laughs> In getting anything with group activity, it's working together, and you have to have this one to work together. Uh, I say a coach has the greatest ally in the world if he isn't afraid to use it, and that's the bench. Put them on a bench. They all love to play. Now, I've heard, I hear comments like, uh, well, he didn't want to play. I think they all want to play. And uh, if you, if you, I don't care how good he is, if he isn't producing, it's just potential. And potential isn't producing isn't, isn't much good. No better than someone else that doesn't have that potential. So I think that putting them on the bench, you have that ally. And, but I tried to explain to my players that every 
person has a role and every role is important. Now, you may not hardly get in the game, but your role is helping develop these players that are going to play more. And that's extremely important. And I like to use with them, use, sort of keep this in mind. I will get ready and then perhaps my chance will come. Now, if you're not ready and your chance comes, when's it going to come again? It might not come again at all. So always think in terms, I will get ready and then perhaps my chance will come. Fill your role. Uh, it is a, is a, heat, a powerful engine in an automobile any important, more important than a wheel? What can you do if you lose a wheel? What good is that engine if you lose a wheel? What, what good is that wheel if you lose a nut that holds it on? You don't have it. So you may be just a nut. You may be just a wheel and you may be a powerful engine. But you, if you're not all together on the same page, uh, we're not going to accomplish uh, what we're capable of accomplishment. And, and now, I don't say it's easy to get them to accept the rules, but you've got to practice this, for example. You've got to pay attention to the players that aren't getting to play very much. Uh, the, the, the players that are getting to play a lot, they're, they're, they get praised in the papers. They've got the alumni patting them on the back and all that. These others, they're not getting that. You have to give it in practice. That's why in some ways I think I became a little closer from a personal point of view with some of my players that didn't get to play very much than I would my stars. And, and uh, they must know that you care for them. It's just because they're not getting to play that much, you still care for them just as much as the one that's playing more. Of course, you have to you have to keep your emotions under control. And my my talking to officials, uh, no official, no opposing player, ever heard me use profanity. I would never hear them call them bad names in that sense. But I I badgered officials. But maybe it was uh, call them the same at both ends, or uh, watch the traveling, or giving some protection, and and things of that sort. And opposing players, uh, I might say, do you ever let so-and-so shoot? Or uh, uh, I might say some words of that, uh, but never would I call them a name or anything of that sort. Uh, but these other things, yes, I was very uh, guilty of. But never the point, I think in 40 years of coaching, I had two technicals called on me in four, a total of 40 years. Well, I think very definitely it's the little things that make the big things happen. It, it's putting your shoes on properly. It's getting the wrinkles out of your socks so you won't get blisters. So those are important things. It's making sure that no uh, soap is left on the shower room floor where someone, maybe not you, but somebody else might, might uh, slip and fall and hurt themselves. Just little things like that that seem, they may seem inconsequential, but uh, I, I think they're important. And I think teaching your youngsters to be courteous to uh, airline stewardesses, courteous to waitresses, uh, courteous to all people in, in hotels, and, and I think makes you a better team. I think it helps you basketball. I think it makes you a better basketball player. I think it brings you together more. I think it makes you more considered, uh, uh, considered of others. And, and team spirit is just being considered of others, in my opinion. And I believe in those little things helped us in that, and I also believed in the discipline. But, but remember, you're imperfect, and when you see that you're wrong, don't be too proud to change. Admit, admit it, and, and all those working with you are going to do better. I learned that uh, back in high school that, that uh, as a high school coach, that uh, you're, you're more susceptible to blisters. I also uh, noticed that most players, uh, college players, wear shoes. High school players did too. Uh, shoes that are uh, uh, too too large. And basketball is a game of movement, quick movement, stops, start, and turns, and change of direction, change of pace. And if there's that much di sliding to the end of the toe, you're you're going to get some blisters. So I, I decided what size shoe you're going to wear. I want your toe right at the end. I don't want it where it has to be bent up, flat. I want it right at the end of the shoe so that when you stop, there's not going to be any sliding back and forth. 
and I think that is that's important. I've, I think I've said that. I think it's, when we, when we have our youngsters, you know, we buy shoes for them. We, we use the thumbnail. You used to say, "Well, get them a thumbnail longer." Kids never get to wear shoes that fit. By the time their foot grows into that shoe, they're worn out, so you get them new shoes and a thumbnail too long. So I think that's just probably the custom of always wearing them uh, uh, too, too, uh, too large, size too large. So I, most, most every player I had, I'd put a size, at least one size smaller than they were accustomed to wearing. Uh, the little thing like never criticize a teammate, never. Never criticize your teammate. That, that's, that's unpardonable. That's my job. I'm paid for it. Pitifully poor, I would tell them, but I'm paid for it. But don't you do it. And um, like, no word of profanity or you're off the floor for the day. No excuse for that. No excuse for that. that, that now that, in turn, to me, will help them maintain self-control. And the maintaining of self-control is going to make them a better basketball player. It's more than just the use of profanity, although I don't want it at all. So I, I think those things are things about the little things. Those, those are little things that I think help bring big things about. No, no, I don't think I was destined at all. I'm a fatalist to some to some degree. Yes, I would say that, but I don't think I was destined. I don't know. Uh, was it? Was it? Was it? But when I went to Purdue, the fact that I did not know at the time that you had to go to summer school every summer to get your degree in, in civil engineering, and I went to Purdue to become a civil engineer. That's what I went there. But when I found out at the end of my freshman year that I'm going to have to go to civil camp every summer, I can't do that. I didn't get paid, and I had to work in the summertime. Uh, was that destiny? That No, nah, it was just something that... High school counseling hadn't made me aware of. High school counseling wasn't as good in those days, uh, certainly. Had I been aware of that, I wouldn't have gone to Purdue. I'm sure of that. I would have probably gone to any university closer, so I could be closer to Nellie, which was only 17 miles from the high school where I went to school. But I wanted to be a civil engineer. But when I couldn't, all right, I can't do it. So don't complain, don't howl. As Dad said, don't complain about the things over which you have no control. Make the most of what you have. and. Uh, so I changed to liberal arts uh, and, and eventually became a school teacher, an English teacher. And um, I don't think it's destiny. And I don't think I was destined to be a, 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 a teacher. No, it just turned out that way. But I don't think it was destiny. Oh, there's a certain amount of chance, I think, in everything, yes. I think there's such a thing as being at the right place at the right time, but I, don't think, I still don't think that's destiny. I think it is just chance. Another time uh, uh, when a plane that I had to, cancel, had to cancel a flight on crashed from Atlanta to, to Raleigh, North Carolina, and everybody was killed. I had, I had a ticket on that plane and had to cancel it to go the next day. I flew over in the same type of plane over the, the next day where this plane had, had, had crashed the day before. Is that destiny? No, that's not destiny. But chance, perhaps. Perhaps luck, yes, there's a certain amount of luck involved. There's a, there's, a, there's a certain amount of luck involved in games. There's a luck when a ground ball hit the third base to Freddie Lindstrom of the New York Giants, a great fielder. The ball hits a pebble and goes over his head. That's luck, uh, I think. It's a chance. Uh, it, had, it wasn't ability or anything that had anything to do with it. That was luck. And I think uh, things of that sort do happen. Uh, eventually, in the course of time, they even out, I believe that, but uh, uh, shooting a free throw, a foul shoots it up there and it banks off the warden and he wasn't intending to bank it at all in. Or one hits, he's missed it completely, it bounces way up high and then comes down through. Uh, that wasn't skill that did it, it was, it was luck, it was chance, I think, and so there are things of that sort that enter into it. And, I think in in all sports, uh, but not just in all sports. It's um, I think salesmen to get a make me make a big sale if he catches the prospective uh, uh, customer at the right time, he makes the sale. If he catches him at the wrong time, he might not make the sale. So uh, that's 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 chance I think and luck to some. So I think there is a certain amount of uh, luck that comes in life itself, whether it be 
not just in sports, but in all professions. Uh, yes. I would probably think that something, if they would buy it, it would be most helpful is what Dad said is, don't compare. Don't try to be better than someone else. But whatever you're doing, try to be the best you can be. Take advantage every day. Make each day your masterpiece. I think that would be uh, one of the things that I could uh, say to them. Now, there are other things that are extremely important. They must have faith. They must believe. They must not complain. There are a lot of things. But if you individually would just say, not compare, just try to make the most of what you have under the conditions that exist for you and try to improve those conditions, no one can do more than that. It would depend on the age of, of these grandchildren, you see, and, and great-grandchildren. I have nine great-grandchildren now, and seven grandchildren. My seven grandchildren are all uh, uh, growing. And uh, uh, the Bible is the one, by all means, the, the, the most important, the, the, the greatest of all. And there's something in it. There's no place in it that you can't learn something. If everybody would, would read it, read it. Study a little bit every day. Uh, there's no other book that can compare with that. There are a lot of good books, a lot of good books, but there's no none that would compare with the good book. I got a lot of requests on occasions by parents that are having their first child, and uh, want what well, would like for me to send them a pyramid and make some inscription on it and maybe a. Uh, uh, some verse from the scriptures, and almost invariably I will say uh, uh, best wishes and I hope you grow up into a world where there will be enduring peace between all nations and then true brotherly love among all people, First Corinthians 13. <laughs> Probably from my early uh, uh, raising on the farm and uh, learning that chores must be done first, but there should always be time for play, and that was dead again, but chores first, but always there should be time for play. And I think maybe that and seeing us lose the farm uh, through no fault of my father's, but that's that we go back might say chance or luck again for some things that happened which I won't go into but uh, uh, Probably from that seeing these things happen and then probably uh, uh, Getting from him at, that uh, always make each day your masterpiece try to uh, Do the best you can do and don't worry about how somebody else you know that that carried over in all my teaching I tried to teach that in English class. Don't worry about this person gonna get an A or something do what else you can do uh, this, uh, In in my uh, coaching uh, I, I probably scouted other teams less than any other college coach in the country Why I want a concentration on my own and try to prepare them for each eventuality. I wouldn't be able to do it, of course, because you're not imperfect, not, but trying to do that. And as time goes by, you'll be prepared more and more as things come up. But worried, more concerned about your own team than the other team. Uh, I, I carried that in individuals, rebounding, where teams and uh, books on rebounding block out, keep the other, I said, go get the ball. I want to get the ball. Now, that doesn't mean I'm not going to try to get in the path of somebody else. But my first interest is assume the shot will be missed, get my hands above his shoulders, and go get the ball. Don't, don't, don't try to keep you from getting it. Go get it. That'll keep him from getting it. And, and, and maybe that comes from that early. I think there's some connection there, and that, and that probably. I, I think anything we are is a result primarily of um, those under whose supervision we've been, those with whom we've been more closely associated, particularly in our impressionable days.
I've been asked, does, do athletics build character? And my answer has been consistent. It can, and it can tear it down. It can do either one. It depends on the leadership. I believe that to be true. Uh, I say that, uh, that uh, in athletics, equal, equal ability, the one with the better character will be the one that will emerge on top. Uh, better character, uh, that means the, 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 by having better you accept things better, you work harder, you don't worry so much about the other fella, you, you do your best. Character, to have character, well as I say, uh, let, let's have a character, not be a character. Uh, um, I, I think character gives you more peace. And if you have more peace with yourself, you're going to function better. I, I, in a way, uh, not probably connected exactly with this, but in, in some other things, when Socrates was falsely imprisoned, facing imminent and unjust death, he was at ease. Uh, there was such tranquility about him that uh, his jailers, who were mean, mean, maybe the meanest people of the day, they couldn't understand it. And they said, why aren't you preparing for death? And Socrates' answer was simply, I've been preparing for death all my life, for the life I've led. If you have character, you're at, peace, at ease with yourself, therefore you're going to have poise and you're going to function near your particular level of competency. I think I was fortunate, and I think I was blessed from my very earliest days. My dad and by Nellie, my high school sweetheart, later my wife, over 53 years. Uh, somehow, I was associated with people that that I think were of immense uh, immense help to me uh, in in many things. I think I, I'm far from far from perfect, but I was blessed to agree that many others never had. It takes so many of our youngsters today in the inner city, the broken homes, and, and they, they miss so much. And uh, um, I, I just, I was fortunate, I was lucky. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm glad that things, well, I don't know. I think Dad also developed within me and my brothers that we don't not don't look back, look forward, don't look back. Uh, you're not going to change anything. Learn from the past, but you're not going to change it. Nothing will change it. And the future is yet to be. And can you affect the future? Yes. How? By what you do every single day. And uh, I believe either consciously or subconsciously, uh, Dad, more than anyone else, brought that about. So I was very, very fortunate, very, very fortunate. Well, it, it's the culmination of getting there. It, it's, Cervantes said the road is better than the inn. And it's the road to getting there is the very important part. Uh, in the end, in some ways, it's exhilarating. In some ways, it's a letdown. It's the getting there. I think Robert Louis Stevenson said it's better to travel, hopefully, than to arrive. Once you arrive, <laughs> the journey's over, in a sense. And it's the journey that's the important thing. Yes, the fact that it is an accomplishment for which you've been working 
gives you a feeling, and I, I think maybe the best feeling from a coaching point of view, when you just see the, the thrill it has given the youngsters under your supervision. Uh, I think that is something that uh, you had me up. Uh, my teams got to the national championship 10 times, the national championship game, and we happened to win every one of those that we got there. Before the end of each game, none of them were determined in the last seconds. We had them won within the last minute or so. And uh, there would be a timeout. There was in every one. Each time I told my players, now, I'm very proud of you. You've had a great achievement. But now, when this is over, don't make a fool out of yourself. Let our alumni do that. Feel good. Cut the nets down, which you want to, but don't, don't. Get, don't get carried away. This is something to, for us to enjoy for the moment. Well, let's not let's not get uh, uh, carried away. But it's been a great accomplishment, and I'm very proud of you. No. Never. Uh. I, I have some games that I call are extremely disappointing. Um, I, I can't really say that I can single out any games that gave me the greatest satisfaction. Uh, there are a lot that did. Not all of them were national championship games. Uh, people feel that when we lost at Notre Dame, after we'd won 88 consecutive games, that must have been a tremendous letdown, and it wasn't at all. Now, had we, we broke the record, the old record was 60 in a row. We broke the record of 61 at Notre Dame. Had we lost that game that would have broken the record, that would have been a letdown. Uh, the people say, how about losing that game in the Astrodome? Uh, for the, for the largest crowd to ever see a game and before the largest televised audience, they say, to ever see a sporting event at that time. Boy, that must have been devastating to lose. They said, no, no. It was a non-conference game. We had to win the conference to get in the tournament in those years. Uh, we were playing with Alcindor definitely, definitely not himself at all. So that was disappointing just like any other game would be disappointing to lose. Every game you lose is disappointing, but nothing like losing a conference game that would keep you out of getting into the tournament. Now, how about the North Carolina State game in 74? Yes, that was a devastating loss. And part of it because we twice had the lead and uh, we lost it. We had 11 point lead in the middle of the second half and got tied. We had a seven-point lead in the overtime and lost, in the first overtime and lost. Yes, that's devastating because we let it get away from us. And I don't want to take anything away from North Carolina State. They took advantage, and that's to their credit, but we let it get away. That's devastating. I should have called timeout before I did. Definitely. Uh -huh. And, uh, mm -hmm. yes. Done differently, but um, people say, "What was the matter with your with your lead protection game?" And I say, "I don't know. We used the same thing we'd been using for years, and it seemed to work pretty well. Didn't work in that game. They don't always work. How about the loss uh, at Notre Dame? And I see it wasn't devastating at all. But Notre Dame scored the last twelve points against us. No one ever did that with that team. No one ever scored twelve consecutive points against us, and they did the last twelve points of the game. We were leading seventy-one to fifty-nine. 70 to 59, and they scored the last uh, 12 points. No, 70 to 59. They scored the last. So uh, uh, that's bad when that happens, but not devastating because it's a non conference game again. And as far as breaking the record, we'd already broken the record by 27 games. A lot of alumni aren't happy. They, they, they wanted 100 in a row, not 88. They weren't happy with 88. They were extremely happy at, at 61 when we broke the old record. But now as we go on and go on, get ready, now they want 100. And if we want 100, if we'd got 100, they'd want more. Uh, but other times, uh, 
break a 30-game losing streak in the first game in 1965 after we'd gone undefeated in 64 back in the L9. No. They just trounced us. They just beat the heck out of us. No. No. We, we, we learned a good lesson from it and not devastating at all. There have been first game of the season, no. no. So there's certain ones, but never did I go into a game at any, at any time feeling that we had to win. Uh, some games you go into feeling that you want to win more than others, that is true. Uh, for certain reasons, and it could be various reasons, not necessarily for a championship, it might be getting into the championship, or yes, that would be. And there are certain games that we get like like um, in my last year I ever coached in the, the semifinal game against Louisville. We were on an overtime and we were fortunate to win. Uh, uh, and and um, I'm, I feel sorry for Denny because I'm close to Denny. And I feel sorry for him. And that, that was the second time that we had knocked him out of the tournament. And each time we went ahead to win, which he might have done had we not. And... Uh, uh, I feel sorry, uh, sorry for Denny. So no great exhilaration on winning that game. You're glad you won, of course, but no, no great exhilaration on winning it. But back to your original question, I don't think I ever went into a game feeling that we had to win. I think if you feel you're going to have to win, you're, you're worried about your job or something. And I never worried about the job. If I lose the job, I'll get another job. Maybe not the job I want, but I'll get a job. And I'll take care of my family. I'll do it. Just do the best you can. Don't worry. I think pressure, you better put pressure on yourself and do a good job. And when you put pressure on yourself to do a good job, you'll do a good job. And that's all you can do. Nobody can do more than that. And if you're affected by those alumni and those outside pressures or whatnot, if you're worried about your job for any other reason, you're... You, you have reason to, but I, I, I can say honestly, and I'm very sincere about it, I never, pressure didn't bother me. I didn't, pressure didn't bother me. It's be like Richard Washington who hit that shot to win the, the Louisville game. Someone said, how in the world did you have Washington set up to get Washington that shot? And I said, he's the one to shoot it. I said, first of all, he's a pretty good shooter. I said, second, Richard's loose as a goose and, and uh, uh, if he misses to him, <laughs> you can't make them all. But he didn't expect to miss because he's a good shooter. He expected to make that shot. Now, if I let somebody else shoot that shot, <laughs> they have to they feel they have to make it. And if you feel you have to do it, that I think hurts your chances of doing it. See, it's kind of like character and reputation. Your character is what you are, and you're the only one that truly knows that. Your reputation is what others perceive you to be, and they can be wrong. So which is the most important? What you really are. It doesn't make any difference what others might think. You'd like for them to think well of you, but it really doesn't make any difference. You'd just like for them to. But boy, it's very important what you think about yourself. That's very important. That's probably the most important thing there is. <laughs>